Aisam alaikum. Would you all please stand for prayer? And please assume a position of prayer most comfortable for you. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. I greet you all in the greeting words of peace. Of I salam alaikum. On behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the brothers and sisters of the Nation of Islam, we would like to thank and welcome each and every one of you, those that are here in Mas Mariam. This is our national center. And those that are watching via webcast, those that are watching via computers and new technology, those that can watch from laptops, iPads, 3G and 4G telephones, we welcome you. Those that are unfortunately at home that are sick, those that are in the hospital, we welcome you too. Please give yourselves a round of applause. The one thing we know about the minister is that he is trying to establish us to be brothers and sisters. He teaches us each and every time that we see him that God most certainly answers prayer. But prayers just don't free float from the sky. The prayers that we might have made this morning, that you might have made a few minutes ago, that you might have meditated as I led in prayer, an answer to that prayer can be seated right next to you or even behind you. But the only way to access that prayer, you got to access that person. So brothers and sisters, turn to your left and to your right and behind you. Introduce yourself and give them the greetings of peace. See, now that's what I'm talking about. The smiles and the spirit live so much higher when we begin to tear down them barriers that an old world put upon us that we can't trust ourselves. And when we're able to reach out and touch ourselves in a proper manner and introduce ourselves in a proper manner for a proper purpose, don't you feel the spirit of God moving closer and closer? Give yourselves a round of applause. The ministry of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. It's a divine work. We have aims and purposes in the nation of Islam that each and every day those of us that are willing to give our time and our sacrifice were striving to fulfill the vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, some of those aims in this resurrection work. And in this resurrection work, it is mental, spiritual, moral, and we also have a program that can help us with a physical aspect of this resurrection work. 
in this resurrection work. Y'all say resurrection? resurrection work. We have aims of peace in this resurrection work. We call them aims of Islam. One of those aims, that's for those that might not know, those that think they know, but now you're going to know. One of our aims is to teach our people and train them into a knowledge of God, whose proper name is Allah, and to teach them of the, the devil, the enemy of God, and the righteous. That's okay with everyone? Is that a good aim? Number two, to teach our people the true religion of God, and that is Islam, or peace. All of the prophets, all of the worshipers, all of the followers of God always submitted their entire will to God. In Arabic, that word is called Islam. Say Islam. Islam. Say submission. submission. Number three, to elevate our moral standards. We know that we need to elevate, especially in America, moral standards. Raise your hands if you agree. Praise be to Allah. Number four, to unite our people in one nation or brotherhood. We began this morning shaking hands. It's called a uniting principle. Do we agree? Raise your hand if we agree. To secure better homes. We can stop right there. Friendships, we need those in all walks of life. This is a universal mission of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We don't stop at color. We don't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, tree of life, way of life, new of life, don't have life. to secure universal recognition by civilized nations of our people. The whole entire planet needs to be re-civilized. And that man that you're going to hear today is in the process of re-civilizing every human being. <laughs> to secure justice for the so-called American Negro, so-called because we ain't that no more. We're the chosen people of God. We're proud to say that. We're not ashamed. We know it, and we want the entire human family to join us in saying we're the chosen people of God. Everybody, we are the chosen people of God. To have protection for our women. Brothers, y'all know we got to do better. We must do better. We don't have any choice but to be better to, to protect the most precious gift God could ever give any man, that is this woman. And lastly, to secure better businesses, schools, and hospitals. As a bad economy goes down, the righteous economy should begin to go up. When we pool our resources, when we give our money, excuse me, that's not my segment, that's somebody else's segment, but he'll be up to go more deeper into number nine. To add more to this, to bring a level of enthusiasm in a way that only he can. We call him the lightning rod, the starter pistol. The man just makes it happen. Brothers and sisters, for those that might not know, for the few that have not heard him, you're about to be electrified. All the way from Indianapolis, Indiana, please give a big warm round of applause to student minister Nuri Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, brothers and sisters. All praises are due to Allah. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah who intervened in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, who came among us and raised up from the midst of us, the greatest human being that ever walked the earth other than God himself. We thank Allah for his messenger, his Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank the two of them for preparing one today that sits in the seat of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He is a divine leader, a divine teacher, I say he's a divine leader. He's, a div he's not a regular leader. He's not a regular teacher. He's not a regular guide. He's one that Allah has anointed and appointed for the time to offer us the supreme explanation and example on how we can go from being Negroes into becoming one with Almighty God Allah. And that man is the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praises are due to Allah. All praises due to Allah. That which he offers us is guidance in a time of trouble. That which he is leading us to is complete salvation for you and me. That which he offers us is a methodology, a means, and a way by which we can gain the power we once had when we first came out of the womb of darkness as originators. We thank Allah for this great man among us. People say, well, you know, he's just a man. No, no, he's not just no man. You, you can say Jay Leno's just a man. You can say Peyton Manning's just a man. You can say George Bush is just a man. 
but you can't say the word Farrakhan and just a man in the same sense. He's a divine leader, teacher, and guide that came to redeem us on behalf of God and his messenger. All praises are due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. And we, we, we don't chant Farrakhan for personality worship. But every time you hear the name of a particular individual, by means of word association, there are principles that come up in your mind. Whenever you say the name Farrakhan, you should hear discipline. When you hear Farrakhan, you should hear noble. When you hear the name Farrakhan, you should see love. You should see wisdom. You should see courage. Is that right? When you hear the name Farrakhan, you should see freedom fighter. When you hear the name Farrakhan, you should see a man that won't bow down, won't buck dance, won't capitulate, won't scratch where he does not itch, but stands up on truth for God and his people. That's the image that should be in the mind when you say the name Farrakhan. So we don't promote the name for the personality's sake. We promote the name for the principle's sake. In fact, words are so powerful, brothers and sisters, that one of the great Japanese doctors of the time, by the name of Masaru Emoto, recently discovered in a study of water. He took a glass of water and played a speaker that had one day heavy metal music and another day classical music. He took that same bottle of water and taped to it, I love you and thank you, and then put another glass on the other side and had, I will kill you and I hate you. After taking this, this water under this voice of classical heavy metal, thank you, I love you, I hate you, I will kill you, they froze the water, put it under a dark field microscope, and noticed that the language in the music and the words even on the piece of paper had a bang on the molecular structure and the composition of the crystals that the frozen water was forming. They found that the negative caused the water to be divided. They found that the negative caused the water to be dirty. They found that the negative caused the water to form crystals that were ugly in makeup. But whenever they had love on the glass, when they had good, clean music coming through the speaker, then the crystal began to form organized, clean, shining, and beautiful. They went on to take the dirty water, the divided water. They took the water that had become ugly and they put it under the voice of various different monks and priests that began to pray for this water. Froze the water after the prayer and based upon the prayer and on the dirty water, the water then stood up and began to look more beautiful. I challenge Masaru Emoto to put on a tape of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and play that through a speaker and put some water in that freeze it and look at it under a microscope. And I guarantee you, you won't find the water more organized, more clean, more united, and more shining. How do you know? Because that was the condition of the black man and woman before we heard the voice of Farrakhan. We were disunited. We were dirty. Is that right? We have become an ugly people. But under the wisdom of Allah's servant, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, we've now united as FOI and MGT. We're beginning to be cleaned up. We're starting to shine again. All because of the water on the brain, water in the body, truth has affected us the way the truth has affected that glass of water. We are the living proof that the supreme idea, the supreme message is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's life-giving teaching. And the supreme vessel to represent that to us is none other than the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for listening. I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. That's living water that can only be drank from a living stream that's tied into a living heaven pouring down on us each and every of our striving to be a live light. We ain't done yet. We're just getting started. Brothers and sisters, the next was a student in the ministry class here in Chicago. A young man that Minister Ishmael Muhammad saw at the age of 14, 15, said, I think you got a special gift. And then being with our brother, being a protege of sorts, 
standing with him, watching him over the years, and he had a chance to share words over the last few years, he's going to grow to be a fine representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Brothers and sisters, one of our young students in the ministry, please give a big warm round of applause to Brother Kahil Yamin. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah who appeared to us in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Bhakti, to whom all holy praises do forever. I further bear witness that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is his messenger and messiah, and that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is their divine representative in our midst today. In their righteous and holy names, I greet the believers and the people of God and the greeting words of peace. We said in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum. Brothers and sisters, the last time the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan blessed us with his presence, he finished the third part of his lecture series entitled, Who are the Real Children of Israel? Where he thoroughly proved that we, the black man and woman of America, are the true children of Israel and are the fulfillment of the promise of the seed of Abraham. We know that no people fit this description more or better than our people, which means that we are the ones to receive that promised man that was prophesied to come that would be like Moses. We know and can prove that this man is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And just as Moses was given a helper in his brother Aaron, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been given the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan as his divine helper. He is his Aaron, who has taken the divine revelation from God and has broken it down and spread it throughout the earth that no man today can stand before God and say they didn't understand the message. This must be made plain today, because as my brother Nuri said, we can no longer continue to look at the minister as, at the minister as a, uh, a good preacher or a leader of a particular organization, when in reality he comes right out of our scriptures. My focus today is to the youth, because if we are the children of Israel, and we are, then there is one more role that must be fulfilled before we get to what the scriptures call the promised land. And we want to let young people know today that you are that Joshua generation born to be soldiers in the army of God to free our people and take us to that promised land. Praise be to Allah. The enemy has fooled my generation into believing that we have no purpose and not good for nothing but sports, singing and rapping and dancing, or the savage life of the hood, when in reality we have one of the most powerful destinies ever written in scriptures. And I realize that many of our young people may not know that much about Joshua and the Bible. So just to give a brief re uh, rundown, Joshua and his troops emerged on the scene because God gave a command to the children of Israel through Moses to go to the Promised Land. But they were afraid to go to the Promised Land because this land was inhabited by giants. Now, of course, this doesn't mean literal giants, but it represents the obstacles that stand in our path as a people and the enemy of our people. I believe this is being fulfilled today through the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan because he has been teaching and warning our people for 50 plus years, even gathering us by the millions, which no man has ever been able to do. But yet you still hear people giving excuses why they can't walk with the man of God, trying to intellectualize every reason possible why they can't walk with this man. But we understand the real reason why they can't walk with this man. It's because of their fear of the giants that stand in our path. Praise be to Allah. So God chose the youth because the youth were not afraid. And if you look and study young people today, we may be a lot of things, but one thing we are not is afraid. Praise be to Allah. And it's interesting in something of a deeper study that the names Joshua and Jesus are pronounced exactly the same in Hebrew. 
and it translates to Yeshua, which means God save us, which has been the prayer of our ancestors who have been in America, who have been enslaved by this enemy. And this is why young people are born warriors today. It's not that this is an accident or there's something wrong with us. God has fashioned us like this for this time out of the prayer of our ancestors for us to help God and his servant save our people in these last days. Nobody has been able to understand my generation. Nobody but the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He looks past our faults and he sees us through the eyes of God. He teaches us that we were born for this time, born for the Messiah to war against this enemy. Praise be to Allah. Some of us might say, we can't believe that. Because we've done so much dirt, it's hard for us to believe that we will be anywhere in the Messiah's plan. But the minister has told us that there's nothing wrong with us. It's something wrong with the enemy who has been ruling us and has set up the condition in the hood for us to do what we do. So God is not interested in condemning us. In fact, he has allowed us to experience the worst part of the condition of our people, putting us through the fire, the fiery furnace of affliction, to strengthen us for what we must do. For too long, we have been doing the enemy's dirty work, pumping their drugs to our people, using their guns to kill one another. And as I leave, I want to say that the Nation of Islam is not trying to change you and give you some watered-down religion and make you soft so you can lose the fire that God has given you for this time. Brothers and sisters, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is here to give us the wisdom that we absolutely need to allow the Spirit of God to ride in on the warrior minds that we already have to conquer this giant. So brothers and sisters, let us open up our hearts and our minds to receive what the man of God has to say to us today. And those, and those of us who are wise enough to accept it will see how God will raise us to heights that we could never fathom. May Allah continue to bless you as I leave you in the greeting words of peace. of salam alaykum. Please bring back to the rush from Brother Jeffrey Muhammad. That should make all of us who consider ourselves old school <laughs> feel real good <laughs> to see the fire of God in that young man be inspired by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, being inspired by Minister Ishmael Muhammad to put aside childish things and to grow to be who he should be. Last week, we were blessed to have our health and wellness program. And Minister Ishmael had invited various health practitioners to come and share to do what they do best. We offered alternative methods of healing and medicine. Now, we're not saying put what you're already doing down. Let's put that disclaimer out. But there are other methods and alternatives than what we're accustomed to doing. One of these health practitioners, she is with us today. And she's going to come and share her relationship of what she knows with what we know and show some symbiosis that we are all one. And the knowledge of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, this program is holistic, mind, spirit, moral, and an aspect for our physical function. Brothers and sisters, please help me to welcome Dr. Suni of New Life Wellness that will give us an idea of the energy in our body that flows with the spiritual energy that we're being taught. Brothers and sisters, a big warm round of applause for Dr. Suni. It is such an honor to be standing in front of the powerful people of God. With this spiritual energy that is in this place, I feel blessed. And I greet you with a Christian blessing of, I love you. God blesses you. And I am so thankful for your presence. I'm thankful for the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and now the work of Honorable Louis Farrakhan. I was introduced to the nation about 15 or 20 years ago through Brother Wahid and his wife. And in my home, 
Not only do we have a Christian Bible, but we also have the Holy Quran. I am Dr. Sunni. I'm a holistic practitioner studying uh, Doctor of Natural Medicine for about 15 or 20 years. I have gone many places to find out how we take care of this powerful, magnificently, wonderfully made vessel called the, the body. And in my spiritual travels, I have learned so much. And I have to, I must, and I'm charged to bring that information back to our people so that our bodies can stand direct and do what is right in God's sight with strength and with power because that's how we were created by the Almighty God. And so in that, I've learned how to be a naturopath. I study nutrition and its relationship to our human vessel as, and also an energy practitioner. And now the paradigm has changed in the uh, aspect of health into energy medicine. You will be seeing and hearing more of that as they shift this paradigm and how our bodies are taken care of. And yes, we do need our medical doctors because if I was to get hit by a car, I do not want you to put herbs and spices on my wound. I want you to take me to the hospital. <laughs> But to take care of my body, I have been given charge by that. We are charged over this body, and we have to be a lot more responsible because our bodies have to stand upright until we decide that our work is done. And it does not have to be abated with no sight, no ability to walk. We do not have to be weak because aging is a myth. Your body repeats the cycle of life if you continue to give life to it. So you have to think right. You have to feel right in your heart about that which God gives you as divine uh, instructions as a spiritual being. And then you have to take care and follow the laws that govern our spiritual body. Last week when I was here and the week before when I was here, I was so impressed by the message about the electrical energy that runs through our system and the mystery about it, but at the same time, the laws that operated in our very body. And so I've been studying brain activity and the chemicalization that takes place in our thinking if we're thinking right, just like the brother said, the very nature of the 80% water that you have will be living water running through the body. Your electrical energies will travel through your whole system and ignite your muscles and your bones to do right. Your cells will feel that energy and open up and receive all that is good that your system is looking for, like good green foods, like excellent good clean protein, not no garbage meat that they give us, but good protein, omegas for your brain that insulates the brain so that the heat that is generated by the electrical currents that is running through it will not be hindered and we won't be having static energy but focused energy to do the work of God. So me as a practitioner, I teach how we control these aspects, how we can get rid of the stagnated energy that runs through our body. Through the iridology, which is an assessment tool, we can see where that energy has been stagnated, how it's been deteriorating some of the tissues in our cells. So we need to really take heed to the teachings, and I'm prepared as a servant to you to teach you all that I know, to assist you with gaining proper good health, brothers and sisters alike, and particularly our young people. They're falling prey to the enemy, and we have to take charge because they're not afraid, like the brother said, but their bodies are not able to stand up to the test. So we have to take charge, and I am your faithful servant, prepared to do whatever is necessary to assist in this resurrection of the human body. God bless you. Can we give Dr. Sunni another round of applause, please? Just keep applauding, brothers and sisters, as I bring up to the podium one of our students in the ministry, Brother Fontaine Muhammad. Please give him a big, warm round of applause. Assalamu alaikum. 
As always, it's an honor to stand before each and every one of you. We begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, the All-Wise, the True and the Living God who came to us in the person of Master W. Farad Muhammad. I further bear witness and I thank Allah, and if I live to be a thousand, I could never thank Allah enough for his messenger Messiah, the most beautiful human being that the black man has ever produced. We thank Allah for the first begotten of the dead, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And if I live to be, all praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. And if I live to be a thousand one more time, you already know how I love to say it, I just flat out. I could never thank Allah enough for the man who raised me literally from death and gave me life, poured into me the water of wisdom from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. He's our beloved leader, teacher, guide, friend, father, spirit of truth walking on earth today. And guess what? He's right here at Mosque Mariam. Give it up for the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and give yourselves a thunderous round of applause. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you something, and I don't have a lot of time to do it. But after all that has been said, I shouldn't have to waste a lot of time. I want to ask you to support the boldest, bravest, most beautiful man walking on the entire planet today with your finances. Is that all right? Will our brothers and sisters from the Ministry of Finance make your way to the front? All over the nation of Islam begin to do likewise. Those who are watching via the internet, there's a beautiful button right there. Please make your mouse move and give a donation live across the internet. We want you right now to begin to take out of your pockets and out of your purses a donation to help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Those who can give a $100 or more dollar donation, simply do it and do it cheerfully. Those who can give a 50 or 20 or 10 or 5 or 1 or as much as one penny, let the receptacles begin to circulate live here at Mosque Mariam. Let them circulate all over the entire nation of Islam. And once again, for those who are watching via the internet, please press that button and make a sacrifice to back our beloved minister, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who is on a mission to serve and to save and to redeem and to resurrect our poor and suffering people all over America and all over the world. Now, brothers and sisters, with that being said, literally the hour that you have come for, it is at hand. So we want to ask you to begin to simply circulate the receptacles. I want to thank you as I begin to wind down and take my leave. I want to thank you on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the entire nation of Islam. For whatever you give this afternoon, it will absolutely be used for the resurrection and redemption work of our poor and suffering people. And so I want to thank you in advance. I want to now introduce to some and present to others. He's the Student National Assistant Minister to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, live from Mosque Mariam. We hear from him almost every week, and we never tire, for he is growing in the ministry each and every day. Will you please help me to receive, as the receptacles continue to circulate, help me to receive the Student National Assistant to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who will introduce the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Help me to receive Brother Minister Ishmael Muhammad with a warm, thunderous Mosque Mariam round of applause. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his many blessings, his many gifts, his goodness, and his mercy to the human family. Brothers and sisters, we have come to that moment and time in our program to hear from our keynote speaker. Two scriptures from the book of Isaiah, 9 and 2 reads, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Isaiah 60, 1 through 3 reads, arise and shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. 
See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We bear witness of those who have walked in darkness, that we have seen a great light that has come to us in the Mahdi, Master Farad Muhammad, his Messiah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and that light continues to shine on us through their servant, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And as he speaks to you and every word that goes into your ear, it will set you off and you will begin to make a motion and will begin to evolve and you will feel the electrical current traveling through the brain cells in your brain and instantly you will begin to transform. I ask you one last question. Are you ready to hear from our beloved minister, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, for indeed the light shines <coughs> upon us. Let us receive the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. <coughs> Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! That means God is the greatest. All praise is due to Allah. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, We give him praise and thanks for his guidance and his blessings through his prophets and messengers. As Muslims, we honor all of God's prophets. We make no distinction between them. We are taught that all of them come from the same eternal source and at the root of all of the teachings of the prophets, it is the same. Whence comes confusion? Since God is not the author of confusion but of peace, how come the religious community of the world is so divided and so filled with anger, hatred, and bitterness toward each other, when if all of the prophets that ever came to the people could come back, you would see one community of prophets of God that love each other, and you would feel the pain of the prophets, seeing how those who use their names hate each other and seek to kill each other over aspects of religion that they don't understand. I am so grateful to God for Moses and the Israelite prophets who gave us the Torah or the Old Testament. I'm grateful to Allah for Esau or Jesus and his apostles who gave us the Injil or the Gospel or the New Testament. And of course, we are exceedingly pleased that he sent into the world Muhammad ibn Abdullah and revealed to him and through him the final revelation to the world of man and mankind the Holy Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am before you not as a student of Moses or Jesus 
or of the prophet Muhammad independent of a man who came. I loved Moses and I loved Jesus. I didn't know much of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a child. But I'm here first and foremost to represent the coming of God. And to remind us of his great love for us and his great mercy toward us that he would not send a prophet but would come himself. And because he came, we are here. And because he came and saw one among us worthy to meet with him, to be taught by him, to be raised by him, and missioned by him to a great people who once were a people, but are considered by the prophets dead, dry bones in a valley, we once were a great people, but we are now all but completely destroyed. But a merciful God loved us, even though we did not have the sense to love ourselves. A merciful God thought enough of us in spite of our foolishness, in spite of our ignorance, in spite of our being made other than ourselves by our open enemy. In spite of all of that, he chose us to be his own people and that he would be our God and our defender, our protector. He chose us. Not because we were better than others. He didn't choose us to arrogate to ourselves that we are the choice and nobody else is. Whenever God chooses you, he has a purpose for your life. You can run from it only so long. But he will whip you into submission as he did the prophet Jonah. Your heart, I'm talking to black people now, has been fashioned through our suffering. Your soul, though ruined, it is prophesied that he would restore your soul. And because of undeserved suffering, he was going to use your heart to bring the whole of humanity back to himself. This is why I took the subject of the children of Israel for so many weeks because we never did understand the children of Israel. Israel here represents the entire race of Caucasian people who were new on our planet and have been the conquerors. 
of space, of the depth of the sea, of the earth, and you don't have to ask, have they conquered us? They have conquered us so thoroughly that they made us into themselves. And we as a people are their children. And they treat us like that. And we act toward them like that. Do you have a job for me? I lost my job. Can, can I please have some welfare? Can you send me to school? See, we are like children asking a parent for things and want the parent to respect us as an equal when we come before them as children. But it was the children of Israel that God chose to visit. It was the children of Israel that because of their suffering and their sojourn in Egypt for 400 years, that he decided to visit them and give them Moses and lead them out of a land of bondage, and he offered them land of their own, only as a sign of you. You have no land that you can call your own, and even though we've tried to call this one ours, they quickly uh, remind us. Uh, uh, don't get it twisted. Uh, just because we helped you to elect a black man to sit in the White House and we regret it totally, We just want to remind you that you are ours. A bad foster parent, too. You know, a parent that gives us the worst food to eat because we are not feeding ourselves. Well, give them the slop. Put a McDonald's, 10 of them in a one block area. Sure, that's a gross exaggeration. But the point is, you're living off of garbage. Your health is the worst of the American people and you are in less than a third world condition. But the Quran says that God is going to make a messenger for you. And that messenger would be the Messiah. And he was going to teach that messenger because everything had already been revealed through the prophets, but he was going to explain the meaning of the books. Teach him the science of life. My God. And raise him and through him raise us to the pinnacle of civilization. That's a great, wouldn't you say that's great news? Good news? It's not only good news for black people. No. Because you're not to hold the news. You 
you got to be a news teller. <laughs> God doesn't raise you for yourself. He raises you for human beings who are suffering. So to make us wise is not to make us like our former slave masters, that we will mistreat the people, but to make us wise is that we will share wisdom with those who are deprived and be the cornerstone of a new government, the cornerstone of a new world, the world that all the prophets said would come about at the end of this world's time. Well, I thank Allah that we are at the end of this world's time. I thank him that he has come to set justice in the earth. And I thank him for this extraordinary human being that he chose to be a messenger messiah to us. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I, uh, I greet you with the greeting words of peace. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Now, let me say how happy I am that God would permit me to come before you one more time. I thank you for your honoring us with your presence and giving us some time out of your precious life to share with you something of wisdom that will benefit all who listen. I thank Allah for Brother Minister Ishmael Muhammad and the wonderful teaching that our brother has been doing. I just love listening to him on Sundays, when I'm not here, I'm always listening and looking. And I want him to know and you to know that when a man preaches like that, shouldn't be an empty seat in the house. If you only wait for me to come out, then this is a cult. And you are cult worshipers. And you're going to be the loser. Because none of us are worthy of worship. Only God. So respecting your teachers is fine. But my God, when a man is teaching like that, it would seem to me that you would fill the house every time brother is talking. So that when I come out, you just have to get soldiers feel. Today, to be very honest, I've been trying to get a subject together. <laughs> and I haven't done that. And I said, you know, to Allah, well, I know it's, there's some things I want to say, but the best thing that Honorable Elijah Muhammad told me 
when I used to write out every word of a radio broadcast. And I did that for three years. And one day he said, oh, no, brother. He said, just go stand up. Have an idea in your mind, but go and stand up and let Allah speak through you. So I find that the best subjects that I teach are the ones where I just stand up and let Allah speak. Now listen, listen, listen. A channel is nothing but a channel. And you do that every day when you turn on the radio. You don't worship the channel. You just look, listen for what's coming through it. <laughs> well, the, your brother is a channel. And to prove this today, now I don't know what's on your minds, but Allah does. So sometimes you come, you have questions you want to throw at the minister. Well, you hold your question on your mind. That's all I'm asking you to do. If you got a question, just hold it. And if by the time I finish today, your question is not answered, well, okay then. I'll have to come back another time. <laughs> and so will you. <laughs> now, in our lessons that Master Farad Muhammad gave us, there is a lesson that asks the question, why does the enemy keep our people illiterate? That's a question. Of course, if I asked, are you illiterate? You wouldn't answer, say, me, I, I am. But let me ask a question. How many of you have been blessed to have a college education and have a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science degree? Would you raise your hands? Hi. That's wonderful. How many of you have been blessed with further education to have a master of arts, master of science, master of business administration, a master degree. Master your hands. Less number. How many of you have been blessed to be a Juris Doctor, Doctor of Law, or a PhD, or a medical doctor. Would you raise your hands? Number much smaller. Mm. I heard on the news the other day that there are 5,000 PhD degrees that are working as janitors, as garbage collectors. Being a janitor is not a disgrace. Being a collector of garbage is not a disgrace. Honest labor is worthy of us, especially if it allows us to take care of our obligations 
But when you see 5,000 PhDs that have no job or are working in jobs that they are overly, 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 overly qualified for, how many of you here are in college and now hope to get your degree? Let me see your hands. Okay. Well, if the PhDs don't have jobs and you are hoping for a degree to do what? To do what? To get a job. Well, there are millions of Americans out of work. The president just lost spectacularly over jobs. And I'll tell you something. It wouldn't matter who is in the White House. your job situation is really not going to improve. I don't mean to be a peddler of doom or gloom, but when you study the prophecies of these books guided in the study by one who has been taught by God, then we know tomorrow's headlines before they appear. Let me give you an example that you're going to see in a short while. Stock market crashes. Worse than 1929. Well, you don't worry about that because you are not a stockholder. But look at the people that have put their hope in stocks. Another headline, dollar falls, hyperinflation, dollar worthless. What are you going to do when the dollar that you love and will hurt others for has no more value. Uh, you have gold, some of you, during the bling season. You, you bought a little gold and you bought a little diamonds and people are telling you right now, bring your old gold. May I tell you, gold never gets old. So you want money, paper, that has no value over gold that in the 60s was $35 an ounce is now over 1300 Another headline coming up. Gold at $2,500 an ounce. Do you have an ounce somewhere? You have your paper. Oh, I see. Well, let me pull out some paper. Wouldn't it be something if you came out one day and saw a man with a thousand dollar bill lighting his cigar? Wouldn't that break your heart? Especially if you don't have a thousand dollars to light yours or even a cigar. But the value of this paper is steadily going down. Headline, a few days ago, the Federal Reserve Bank 
buying up U.S. treasuries. Look, brothers and sisters, this is serious. Now, of course, you know the latest gossip. Jay-Z and, and, and J.C. Hammer having a fight. You know about Lindsay Lohan, poor child, and Taylor Swift and... Yes, and Kanye. You are up on all the garbage. You heard about Bishop Eddie Long, and that's been your conversation and others. And but what will be the future of America when private bankers buy up U.S. Treasuries. Well, I don't know nothing about that. Uh, all I know is, I know. And that's why you're in the right place today. Now, let's go back to the question. Why does the enemy keep our people illiterate? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave this answer when he was three years old in the teachings so that he can use them for a tool and also a slave. He keeps them blind to themselves so that he can master them. I'm going to ask another question. How many of you are in high school or have dropped out? Would you raise your hands? Nobody wants to admit that. Come on now. You at home. You know, that's, that's cool. You're in high school or you dropped out? In high school. High school. High school. Dropped out. Okay. High school. Dropped out. High school, okay. Do you know that many millions of Americans are getting a high school diploma and are considered functionally illiterate? I'm not talking about a few people. I'm talking about millions. Now, if I am a functional illiterate, meaning I cannot read or write at the grade level that I got my diploma from high school uh, on, but I can't write at that level, I cannot read at that level, but I'm out in the world now. Well, if I can't read, books don't excite me. If I can't read, then I am an oral person. So my ear is the most important instrument in my life because it is through the ear that a word will come that will keep me ignorant. It is through my ear that a word will come that can start me growing toward wisdom. In this Bible, when God speaks to Israel, 
I've never read once where God told Israel to read. God told Israel, hearken, hear, listen to the voice of God. So most people get their knowledge from what they hear, not necessarily from what they read. Now, knowledge is your birthright. Every human being should be gifted with the right to know self and the environment and the universe into which God gave us birth and life. for us to come out of our mother's wombs and be 20 years old, 30 years old, not able to read. Victims now of where we place our ear. Who do you listen to? Well, if I'm a gangbanger, I listen to my buddies. And some of them have knowledge that they pass on to the members of their group, but not necessarily wisdom. Some knowledge. Well, if the leader knows more than the followers, and the leader is ignorant, then the scriptures of the Bible are correct. If the blind lead the blind, both fall in the ditch. Now, in Chicago alone, nearly 50% of our children drop out of school. Among whites and Hispanics, the number is outrageously large as well. Now, they use sports figures and entertainment figures to tell you, stay in school. That's like going to Cook County Jail and telling the inmate, stay in Cook County. Staying in a school that will let you out as a functional illiterate is a waste of your life and your time. Something is wrong with the educational system that this is the result of what it produces. Well, look, if I turn on my radio, my ears and the air waves are feeding my brain cells, producing for me my mind. So I turn my dial to the funkiest station because I like funk. I mean, just the language should tell you you should stay away. When somebody is funky, you're trying to tell them, look, there's a bathroom here, take a shower, put a little deodorant on. You smell terrible. Well, when something is funk, of course, 
This is a terrible age that we live in because good becomes bad, bad becomes good. When something is funky, it's nice, it's right. It's just a messed up group of igno uh, ignoramuses that are being used as a tool. Let me see. Now, the jobs that used to be around for the unlearned, unskilled labor force. See, when I was coming up, men had jobs. You would see them with their lunch pail going out to work. Mommy was at home preparing the sandwich. Daddy and Grandpa, if you remember back far enough, they had a little job. And off of one man's pay, they were able to put food on the table and at Easter time, get you a little suit or a dress or something nice for Christmas. But today, today, you have hardly nothing to look forward to. You can't look forward to a job because the jobs are not there. So how do you survive when you turn on your TV and you see all this wonderful stuff that is being offered right next to a food commercial? McDonald's as the chief programmer of your babies that are now telling you where to take them. Mommy, I want, I want to go to McDonald's. And silly mommy, all right, me too. So you're living off of the garbage that is being fed to you. You call it fast food. but it's killing the American people. Well, I don't go to McDonald's. I go to where? Well, I go to the corner store because in the black community, it's called a food desert because there are not adequate supplies of fresh fruit and vegetables available. So you're eating out of cans or you're eating really things that your health has been grossly and greatly compromised. Why does the enemy keep our people illiterate so that he can use them as a tool? A tool for what? What is a tool? It is an implement, an instrument or utensil held in the hand and used to form, shape, fasten, add to, take away from, or otherwise change something by cutting, hitting, digging, rubbing. But it is also a person used to accomplish another's purposes. All my young brothers here, 18 years of age, please raise your hand, 18 and up. All my sisters, raise your hand if you're 18 or up. Okay, now look. War is on the horizon, another headline. Israel attacks Iran. America comes to Israel's aid.
we have to have volunteers because we don't have the draft now. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> well, we got to make the armed forces attractive like a whopper. So we're going to make <clears throat> the armed forces attractive. Be all that you can be. Join the army. And you see them, they're crispy, sharp. The Marines, they're crispy, sharp. And you in the hood, you know. Sharp. Mm -hmm. I ain't got no job, I dropped out of school. This is a chance for me to get some money, see the world, and perhaps get an education. Yeah, that's the bait. You know, when you go fishing, you always hide the hook with the bait that the fish likes. <clears throat> So you join. You're in boot camp now. How many of us have been to boot camp? Now, okay, thank you so much. Sisters, you've been to boot camp too? <laughs> oh, you got the boot in your camp. <laughs> they call that domestic violence. Excuse me. Now we're smiling, we may be laughing, but gaining knowledge should be a pleasurable experience. You know, when you're in school, if it's not pleasurable, who wants to be there? If I'm not growing, who wants to be there? If I'm not learning something useful, who wants to be there? Now, boot camp. I cut your hair. Sorry about them dreads, brother, but can't have that. You clip it all down, you know, and you're a soldier now. But there's an enemy somewhere. See, any time you're a soldier, being sent to Iraq or Afghanistan. You're not sent there to build a country. You're a soldier. Soldiers are sent to do what soldiers do. They kill. Am I making sense? Now, look at how crazy the system is, you're a mother. You're in, at home with your children. And now you are off to war. In the 40s, they never took a woman out of her house, took her away from her children, and sent her to war. Don't you know you can't kill and nurture at the same time? By nature, you are a nurturer of human life. But once they take you out of the home and put you in boot camp and send you to Afghanistan, then they had to teach you of an enemy that would take your life and put it in your heart to take that enemy's life. So before war, they have to make you hate the people that they're going to send you to war against. What made Muhammad Ali a great, honored, loved, and respected human being? Because when they asked him, 
to step forward to join the army, he said, I'm not going. He said, the Viet Cong have not done anything to me. They never call me nigger. Wait now. That may sound simple, but somebody that does not respect your life is your enemy. So where are you going over there when your enemy is right here? See, so now, wait, 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 wait. But if I'm going to give you a job because you don't have one, don't know how to make one, I make the armed forces attractive. I make you a killer. I send you overseas. You do one tour of duty, two tours of duty, three tours of duty, and you come back home and there is no job. And you've been trained to kill. The economy falling apart. And the first law is survival. Look at where we live in the hood, man. You don't have an education that gives you an opportunity to be all that you could be. Man, Columbus discovered America. I mean, come on. George Washington, he never told a lie, you know, sweet George. What are you being taught that you can actually use almost nothing? That's perpetrating a fraud to bring you to college and ask your parents to pay this kind of money and then you borrow money from the government and when you leave college and can't find a job, you have a debt to pay and no money with which to pay it. That's perpetrating a fraud. So our young people are being used as tools. When the war was going in Iraq and every day they would come on the news with the casualties. Did you notice the ages? 18, 19, 20, 22, 24. And on television, they call them heroes. They died for our country. Is it the truth? I'm asking a question. Did they really die for the benefit of the country, for freedom, for justice, for equity? Or did they die for oil, for drugs, to give America power in the Middle East to control the oil coming out of that region of the world? This is what you died for, but who can tell you the truth? Someone stands up to tell you the truth. We are anti American. We are haters. When in fact, we are the real patriots. Freeing the American people from the bondage of ignorance that allows government to misuse their lives. I watched President Bush go home at night to his children at the White House, state dinners, Rumsfeld, Cheney, 
Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell. See, we go home to our children. What do, you, what do those mothers go home to? Those fathers, those friends whose hearts are aching over their friends that perished and are still perishing, or they come home broken on drugs, wounds that can never heal, legs gone, arms gone, face destroyed. And then government sometimes won't give them the money they deserve. Try to find a way out of paying the soldiers who paid the ultimate price for the Agent Orange that has destroyed them. Some of our people think we've moved out of the inner cities to the suburbs, and we didn't know that we were moving out of a place where we had relative safety to an environment that looks good, but it's near some dump that is poisoning the water table. Your house looks better, but your health is worse because you're drinking water that is death. Who cares about you? Does government really care? Does corporate America really care? Then the last one to care must be you and me and us. And if we don't care, we go along with our own destruction because we're too cowardly to speak up, to unite, and to bring about real meaningful change. So, He keeps us ignorant so that he may use us as a tool and also a slave. Now, we wouldn't want to think that in 2010 that we are functioning as slaves. But a slave is a human being who is owned as property and is absolutely subject to the will of another. My God, do you really think that we are free? Then why did Jesus say you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free? Then how can you know the truth except there's somebody willing to sacrifice their life to tell it? because there are those who don't want the masses to learn so that they can keep us as tools and slaves. This is not a race thing. There are white people that are in this condition. There are Hispanics. There are Asians. But we are the worst of. So the Bible says, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Knowledge. He keeps us shackled. It's a metal fastening, usually one of a linked pair. You know how when we get arrested, and the arms are here, and the feet are shackled. Can you walk good? Have you seen those that are arrested trying to walk? They have to put their hand on their head when they put them in the vehicle. 
I've never had that experience, but I know some of us have. And sometimes if they want to be real mean, they just push your head into the automobile. Some of you have had that experience. Eh? Shackled, man. But you know the worst kind of shackle? is when you're supposed to have an education and yet the education does not give you power to make a life for yourself. Those are serious shackles. Only a few more minutes. In the lessons and teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, um, he talked about the 85%, the 10%, and the 5%. Some of my brothers here may belong to the 5% nation. This may not be the subject that you thought you were going to hear, but it may be the subject that you need to hear. <laughs> because the blight of ignorance that is on the people is so shackling them. I was not feeling well for the last few days. I laid in my bed and I turned the television and there was Jerry Springer. Now, I remember when Jerry Springer first came on television, he sent me a letter. He wanted me to come on his television show. I didn't think that much of Mr. Springer then, so I paid him no attention. Well, since then, he's really become an icon. But an icon of filth, degeneracy, and the manifest ignorance of the people and people laugh and cheer at ignorance. That's a human being that could be as great as any other human being. But they're shackled here and shackled to their sexual depravity. Come on. So I usually would not listen, but I'm not going to lie. What? No, I said, I want to see this. A beautiful, she could have been Hispanic, but or a dark, more dark-skinned Caucasian. They were featuring strippers. <laughs> now this, she was a beautiful woman and she walked and came down the pole and did her stuff and for the whole hour she was off to the side just showing her wares while the people coming on to talk were strippers who got outstripped by somebody who took their boyfriend or whatnot. And then they start fighting and coming up. And, I, and the people in the audience, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. I said, man. No, but what I was looking at is madness that's making money for a few at the expense 
of the mental state of the American people. If you don't demand better, you will never get better. And right after that, Maury Povich came on. Now, I really had to keep my dial there. Because there was a beautiful black sister who swore that this brother, she was looking for her baby's daddy. And he showed up on the Maury Povich show with two other women claiming he was their baby daddy. May the Lord have mercy on us, boy, I'm telling you. This, this is madness. The poor girl, her baby was 18 months old. And she'd been looking for the father, found him on the Maury Povich show. trying to defend himself against two other women who accused him. Now, you say, well, minister, why would you waste time on that? No, no, no. That's the condition of the ignorance of the people. Do you understand that the masses of our people are in that condition? This is a serious problem when you call yourself in a democracy. You're supposed to be an enlightened electorate that knows how to choose people to serve your self-interest. But if you don't know what your self-interest is, who will you choose to represent your self-interest? So the Tea Party is galloping on. And the American people think that Obama has taken their country. Poor fella. The country has been taken all right, but it's not by Obama. Obama has not offered to buy the U.S. Treasuries. America is so in debt that the Federal Reserve can offer to buy U.S. Treasuries and print money and put money into America's sick economic system and the stock market goes up as the wealth of America goes down. Brothers and sisters, this is serious. 85% of the people, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Jew, Gentile, 85% are uncivilized. When you got a, a woman that will get on television and just pull down her garment and show her breasts, that's not civilized. When they used to show you Tarzan in the jungle and you saw some people running through the jungle with no clothes on, what did you think of them? Oh my God, how uncivilized. Now you strip it. You say, I'm not a stripper. The heck you are not. You don't care anymore. There's no sense of decency and shame. You can walk around with a thong, call yourself going to uh, the, the beach. Ain't that a beach? No, I said a beach. A beach.
and you're happy over yourself like that? When you degrade a woman, you are destroying your nation. And when you as a woman allow any man to degrade you, you are participating not only in your destruction, but in the destruction of the moral character and fiber of a nation. You don't design your clothes. Somebody else is designing them. And they're filthy. I went to the mall, and there was a woman. She had on these low-cut uh, jeans. And I don't know whether she dropped something on purpose, but I'm embarrassed. I mean, I have to tell you, I turned my head, but I did see. <laughs> but some of you like that kind of attention. When men look at you like that in that lustful, suggestive way, you feel your power as a woman, but you feel your, the misuse of your power because your real power is between your ears, not between your legs. <laughs> Who is the 85% uncivilized people, poison animal eaters, slaves from mental death and power, people who do not know the living God or their origin in this world, and they worship that which they know not what. Easily led in the wrong direction, but hard to lead in the right. That's the condition of the masses in Africa, in Asia, in Israel. I don't care where they are. The masses are under this kind of mentality which is from Satan himself. That's the 85%. But then there's a 10% that are the rich, the slave makers of the poor, who teach the poor lies, making the poor believe that there's some mystery God up in space that's going to do something for you. You're searching for this mystery God. But it's really you that when you find yourself and your connection to God, you have found God. Now get up and do something to prove that you have found God in your life. are known as the blood suckers of the poor. I'm almost finished. <laughs> Strange. At the only time a command was given to read was in the revelation of this book. Quran. It's in the 96th chapter of the Holy Quran. May I read? Yeah. It, it's the first revelation that Muhammad the prophet heard when he was in a cave. It's the 96th surah. The number is significant. You have a nine and a six. During the theology of time, 
the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us about one and the 10,000 parts that it takes to make up one. And if you look at the one, he brought it down in an angle and then it started rotating, making six. So the Holy Quran and the Bible teach that this universe is made on the number six. But it's a one that starts rotating. Now just listen, just, just listen. This 96 surah is called Al-Alaq, the clot. And it reads like this. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Read. In the name of thy Lord, who creates, creates man from a clot. Read, and thy Lord is most generous, who taught by the pen, taught man what he knew not. Those are the first verses that Muhammad heard. You can't find that anywhere. In my reading of the Bible, I always hear, hear, listen, the word of God. But here, a command is given to Muhammad to read. And it says, Muhammad said to the voice that he heard, but I can't read. And Allah never said, oh, I understand. He just said it again, read. In the name of your Lord, with the help of God, read, who created man from a clot and taught man by the pen what man knew not. If you refuse to learn to read, then God cannot instruct you in his ways except through your ability to read his communication that he gave to his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Read. That's an order from God. Read, but there was no book. So wait, 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 wait. If the man could not read and there was no book, then what was he to read? So after 23 years of hearing and his companions writing down what he heard, this Quran was formed and the arrangement of it was guided by Allah. So you would think that the first five verses that he heard should be in the first surah or the first chapter but it's way in the 96th chapter. Read. Now, I spent the weekend just trying to study the clot. And I'd like to share with you what al-alaq means in Arabic. Not that I'm an Arabic scholar, but I, I'm telling you what the Arab scholars say. Well, why don't you know Arabic? Well, 
My people don't know it. So, why would I come to you speaking Arabic and you can hardly speak English? So Allah never sends a messenger, but he sends that messenger delivering the message in the language that the people understand. Otherwise, you would call God stupid. Now look, according to the Arabic scholars, the word alaka has three meanings. One, leech. Two, suspended thing. Three, blood clot. Each one of these meanings has meaning. Now to the sisters, let me say to you how a woman is in the sight of God. Because it is only through you that the species of human beings comes into existence. You agree? So your wounds represent the workshop of God. Every great human being came from your womb. Every terrible human being. <laughs> and wouldn't you hope to produce a human from your womb that would bring pleasure in your life that God himself would be pleased with? Well, there's a way to do that. You don't lay down in the back of a truck, but you can. And sometimes look up on a nice child. From the back of a truck, my son was conceived. <laughs> I'm not trying to be comical today, but it's just coming out that way. You know, but seriously, many of us are ashamed of the circumstances of our birth. But you need not be. Because the circumstances of your birth help to shape you, form you. Now, Allah says, I created you in the womb. See, not your mother, not your father, God. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, and there's an argument, when is life in the womb? Because they're trying to make it seem easy to you to abort life. I want to say before I go any further to any sister in this audience who is watching by television or whatnot, this is not condemnation of you if you have had an abortion. But it is instruction for you that in the future you will not do this. The past is the past. And what we do in ignorance is done. But I want to share with you some knowledge today that makes your womb so sacred. And what is within it so sacred that you would not want to abort it. Now, I don't agree. That if somebody raped me and is, I'm pregnant, that I should carry that to term. Hell no. Not only kill the rapist, damn it, his seed will not come from none of ours. See?
No, some murders are justified. You just have to know when. But just to have sex and find out we're pregnant and not want the embarrassment of a pregnancy or the strain and pain of a pregnancy so you kill what is in the womb because the government says it's okay. Well, the government is saying a lot of things are okay today that God does not agree with. Sisters, from the moment that sperm meets that egg, the first cell of life begins. That's all right. It's, it's someone fainted. Don't be overly alarmed. Get some cold water, some ice. There's a nurse on the scene. We'll take care of it. Let's get back to our lesson, if you don't mind. <laughs> now, since you can't help her, whoever fainted, help is there. So where should your attention be? <laughs> On the word. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the moment that that sperm touches that egg, the first cell of life begins. You wonder what happens to the rest of the sperm. Since there are hundreds of millions sometimes emitted, but only one can do the job. Some die in the vaginal tract because they're not strong enough to make the journey, but the few that make the journey, only one can fertilize the egg and the others become food for the newly fertilized egg. God wastes nothing. Well, what about those that died? They were unworthy to live. And wait a minute, how dare you say something like that, minister? You have to be worthy to come to birth because life is a journey that has many ups and downs and ain't, life is not easy. So in order for you to be fit to run the race of life, God starts the selection process when the sperm is emitted into the vaginal tract. Are you understanding me? Now, I had a picture of a clot that had something that looked like tentacles coming out of, the, of this clot. These tentacles are that which this refers to as the leech. You know, there are leeches in life. I'm sure everybody has met one. And some of us have become one. But a leech is that which attaches itself to a host and feeds from it to grow its own life. So when you see leeches on the flesh of a human being, the leech has to be kind of pried away because it's not willing to give up the suction. So they apply fire 
and sometimes other instruments to pull the leech away. This anatomy is such that the body wants to reject a foreign entity. So this leech-like activity of the first life cell, it starts rotating, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, in the triple darkness of the womb. I just think of a, a clot, a, 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 um, I'm sorry, a cell of blood turning in the darkness of your womb. How does it turn? What is the axis upon which it turns? See, showing you that there's light in the darkness of the womb. There's electricity in the darkness of the womb so that first cell of life as it rotates, it has to rotate on an axis. It starts dividing, building, then the leech, boom. It latches on to the wall of your uterus. This is why the enemy is giving the women certain kinds of of cleansers that are chemically not good for the, the strength of your uterus. So when you use these chemicals that have uh, things that take away odor and all of this, this is chemical. But what it's doing, it's breaking down the wall of your uterus. So even sometimes when you wish to get pregnant and you do uh, have the connection between the sperm and the egg, when it gets to the second week or the third week, it can't hold on. And you have a miscarriage. Once that lump of congealed blood is formed, it's a very ugly looking thing. I'm not going to ask a question about um, about uh, miscarriages or abortions. If you've ever seen an aborted life in the clot stage, it's very, very ugly. And the reason you have to use some kind of instrument to take that life away from the uterus is because it's holding firm. The Quran calls it, it's finding a firm resting place. Isn't that beautiful language? Now it's growing. It's life. But if you take it in that stage, you take it in its ugliness of form. But if you allow it to stay, to turn, it becomes a life that you can hold and nurse, enjoy, and watch it grow. Why did Allah call this chapter containing these powerful words the clot. See, if you have nothing to attach yourself to, you're a life germ 
that is like wasted. It's like having a woman having sex with a woman who's not ovulating. Well, you got something out of it, but not life. So you keep trying if it is life that you want until she can tell you that she's missed her menses. Well, where did the blood go? That we're used to seeing every 28 days. Where did it go? It became a part of the process of the growth of a new life. You are such a magnificent creation. And let me tell you, for any man to make you think that your only value is his pleasure and not the pleasure of God, then that is an ignorant man that is destructive of civilization. You are who we measure civilization by. We don't measure it by the man, it's by you. So when you are decent, when you are highly civilized, when you're articulate, when you know how to walk, when you know how to sit, when you know how to talk, when you keep your voice moderate, you know, when you know how to be you, Nothing more beautiful than you. But you spend so much money on the outside <laughs> and not enough money on the inside. I'm coming to this. A leech, a suspended thing, because it's hanging now from the wall of the uterus and it's forming a lump of congealed blood. And it is from that humble beginning that all of us came. It's in the chapter where we are asked to read because when you don't know how to read, you cannot evolve into the great civilized man and woman that you could become. So illiteracy is a blight on the human family. I see a doctor, Larry is here. I wanted to ask you, you know, because I want, when this lecture is over, I wanted to ask those of us not to be ashamed if you don't read well. That's not for you to be ashamed of. It's for the society to be ashamed of an educational system that can turn you out as a functional illiterate. Does that make sense? So I wanted to ask Dr. Larry, is it possible to set up a reading class at night that will allow believers and non-believers who don't know how to read to come here to Muhammad Mosque and learn the value of this first command that God gave to Muhammad, read. Dr. Larry, can that be arranged? We can do that? Thank you, sir. Do you know?
we have students at Muhammad University of Islam that are learning a study technology and they, some of them, would be willing to help their elders, anybody that wants to know how to read. We will not permit us to go on in life illiterate. Now I close. A people that cannot read are as ugly in their development as a clot is in the ugliness of its development. But the clot has to stay in a right environment attached to a source that will give it life. Am I making sense? If there is no attachment, if you're not attached to your school and we lose attachment, I mean, why would you drop out? I'm not attached to that. Because that may not be attached to you. But here, see, we love you. Now, let me tell you something, brother and sister. This is not punk stuff. We love you. And what we hate is the ignorance that disallows you from realizing your full potential. In this Quran, I close with the, the seventh surah, the 157th verse. It's about a prophet. Listen, he's called the messenger prophet the Ummi, U-M-M-I. Ummi means one who neither writes nor reads a writing. So here's God now choosing a man who could neither read nor write. So what should that tell you if you can't read, if you can't write? That doesn't mean that you can't perform and manifest your own greatness if God chose a man through whom he gave this supreme revelation who could neither read nor write, but yet taught and now has 1,600,000,000 followers, most of whom read and write and have become the scholars that have set the world on fire. So, sister, if you can't read, I know there's a pride thing. I don't want to admit that I'm having a problem. But let me tell you something, it's not your fault. You know, it's your fault if you don't do something about it. But listen, family, listen. Do you know when I was a youngster in school, about 72 years ago, phonics was as relevant to reading as reading itself. So I was a young boy, could read hard words because of phonics. Now you have to go buy phonics because phonics was taken out of the public schools. Why was that? See, 
The enemy knows that anything you want to learn in this life, it is somewhere written in a book. And when you got a people who don't read and refuse to learn to read, they will live their lives in ignorance of what they could have become if only they obeyed this command in the Holy Quran, read. Now, wait a minute. Let's take a moment to look at Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. When the angel Gabriel spoke to him and said, read, his words were, I can't read. That didn't stop the angel from saying it. Again, read. In other words, don't tell me what you can't do. I'm giving you an order. Read. Now, when God gives you an order, if you're any kind of soldier, shouldn't you obey a righteous command? What did God ask the prophet to do except read? But the prophet could have said to him, look, man, there's nothing here to read. What are you talking about? Suppose I tell you that that book that became the Holy Quran came through Muhammad, but it was for a Muhammad that would be in that same condition in the last days of the present world. The children of Israel would receive an Ummi messenger prophet, Messiah, a man that could neither read nor write, a man from the hills of Georgia, a man that had to share crop. And some of you from the South, you know what I'm talking about. You couldn't go to school when it was cotton picking time. You young people don't know that, right? Bring up this book, um, The Secret Relationship. I, I, I just want a copy of it so I can I mean, I have mine in, in the back room if somebody would go in my case and... Oh, you have it. Oh, bless you, Brother Father. Now, of course, if you can't read, it's not interesting. But we put this book out, The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews. This is not for hate. Listen to me. Most of the common black people have no interrelationship with the Jewish people. They don't own the shops anymore that we used to have a relationship with them because they own the shops. Well, the shops are closed. It's gone on to other things. So you have no real relationship. But if you're a football player, a basketball player, a baseball player, if you are a singer, a dancer, a rapper, a musician, somewhere along the line, you're going to meet with a Jewish entrepreneur who want to be your manager, your agent. Talk to me. Oh, Farrakhan, I was enjoying the lecture. Why? why? Why did you have to get to that? No, no, no. I really want you to understand why this book is necessary. See, any of us that have a relationship with the Jewish people, you're always at a disadvantage. Because they know you. 
but you don't know them. So when you are dealing with a people that you don't know, and they're dealing with an entity that they do know, they always have the upper hand with you in any negotiation, contract negotiation. Anytime you meet them, you are at a disadvantage because you don't know your origin in the world or theirs. But when you come here, it's not about hate. It's about removing ignorance that allows others to use you as a tool and also a slave to keep you shackled to ignorance. See? Now, if you can't read, oh, this book is so valuable. Well, it ain't the Holy Quran. Nobody will help you when you read it. <laughs> it's not the Bible. But I can take passages out of the Bible and Quran that if you understand this, it will deepen your understanding of just one ayat or verse of the Quran. Now to those Jewish people who are watching by television, listen, I know you don't like Farrakhan, I understand. But I, 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 I'm not a hater of you. I know how you got where you are. I know how you became who you are. Not that I knew it, I was taught it by a man that was taught by God. And I cannot help. I can't go back on that knowledge. I can't act as though I don't know when I do know. So you see, when a con man knows that you know the game, the con man can't con no more. If you like to play dice and you load your dice on your unsuspecting dice players, once they find out that your dice is loaded, they load up their weapon and load you up with lots of caps. So the point is we want to live in a world free of con. We want to live in a world free of tricks, free of lies, deceit, treachery. And the only way we can live in a world that's like that is that we have to become imbued with knowledge, love knowledge, have an insatiable desire for knowledge, and that means we must become readers. So let's look at this. Those who follow the messenger prophet, the Ummi, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the Gospel. I had a discussion with some wonderful Muslims over point number 12. <laughs> and I said, you know, that point remains on the back page of our paper because there's so much that you have not learned from its being there. And I said, there's a whole body of knowledge that supports point number 12. So we would be glad to sit down with your scholars, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. We need to have that kind of discussion over those two titles that are mentioned in point number 12, Massey, 
Messiah and Mahdi. That will set the whole world free. A sensible discussion of point number 12 without vitriol and bitterness. Because we're not going to give that point up. If the whole world comes against us, we'll just have to stand against the world. We know something. And we are willing to prove the something that we have been blessed to know. So this messenger prophet, he enjoins them good. Who's them? That's the children of Israel. And forbids them evil. And makes lawful to them the good things and prohibits for them impure things and removes from them their burdens and the shackles which were on them. So those who believe in him and help him and follow the light which has been sent down with him, these are the successful. Don't, don't you want to be successful with your life? It's the only life you have. Don't you want to use the time that God has blessed you and me with to make ourselves successful in what we desire to do and be of good? Yeah. Of course you do. Well, okay, what are you willing to sacrifice to be successful? I wanted to play the violin. Well, I really didn't want to. My mother wanted me to. But after I grew to love it, she never had to force me to practice. I drove her crazy. Practicing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours a day sometimes. What did I sacrifice? When you want to be great in life, it's something you have to give up. So you have to think now, I want to be successful. I can't read like I want to. I want to read, then sacrifice some time. Just make up your mind, I'm going to do it. Let me tell you something. When you make up your mind, honest to God, in less than six months, you'll be reading anything, anything that you desire to read. The problem book says that we only speak 400 words successfully. That's the limit of most of our vocab vocabulary. And we don't have 400. You know, it's MF this and SOB that and FU this. And... What, did I say something wrong? But isn't that the language pattern? When we go to the movies, it's disgusting. Every third word, F U U, F N, F N, F N, F N. Well, now, man. Is, is there some other word that we could use? Of course there is. Is there a word that better describes who you are than MF? Yes, there's another word. Well, what is the word? I don't know. Come to the class then. See, once you learn to read, your vocabulary will expand to the point, not that you want to show off, like most of our learned ones do. They'll come to speak to a group and they want to impress them, you know. Yes, and um, you know, the, the myriad things, uh, the, 
I ran into a plethora of problems and I was astounded by such magnificent reality. And they were, my God, what did you say? Well, hell, I didn't know what I was saying, but I was, I was hoping that you would like what I was saying. See, we want to be impressive rather than expressive. See, so if you really want to be impressive, then become expressive and speak a language that the people readily understand. So my dear and beloved brothers, sisters, Elijah Muhammad, the Ummi prophet, the messenger prophet, that was found written of in the Torah and the gospel, is among us today. He's enlightening us. He's removing from us the burdens and the shackles which were on us. He's forbidding for us the evil and uh, impure things and making lawful to us the good things. And so I think we're on the path to great success. But in order to do that, we have to believe in him. Now, now, in this sense, I have to claim that I'm trying to be an example. See, I'm just attached. Kind of like a leech, you know what I'm saying? But in the most positive way, I'm attached to the lifeline of God and his Messiah. Now look, wait, wait, wait now. Wait. When you have that attachment, see? Now naturally, once you start getting attached, somebody wants to detach you from that to which you are attached. You go home and say, man, I was at the mosque today and I heard Farrakhan, that hater, that bigot, that anti-Semite, that anti-Christian, he's not a real Muslim, you know. And just as you were getting attached. So you go home and a word hits you and breaks your attachment. So your friend that brought you, they ask, are you coming back next week? Ishmael is talking, man, he got a great stuff. Well, I think I, I've had something to do. You start making excuses because you've become detached. And when you become detached from that which gives you life, you have aborted the process that will bring you success. So dear beloved, dear beloved believers, people of God, you know, attach yourselves to that man. Believe in him. Honor him. And it doesn't stop there. See, you say you're attached to Jesus. <laughs> That's a great attachment. But if you really are attached to Jesus, you wouldn't be a Negro. You wouldn't be colored girls. See, if you're attached to Jesus, the word nigger could never come out of your mouth. Because Jesus don't make niggers. Jesus don't make devils. Jesus makes people into God. 
So you're not really attached to Jesus. You're attached to the beauty of his name, the beauty of his character, but the beauty of his name and character has not touched most of you who claim that you're Christians. You have the cross on, that's good. But are you Christ-like? Come on, come on, come on. Well, why aren't you? Why aren't you Christ-like? Because there's no example of what Christ, being Christ-like is. You have some wonderful preachers who are trying to be that, and we applaud them and honor them. Stay attached then to a good teacher of righteous principles who tries to live what he or she teaches. Stay attached. When you find a good one, stay attached. See? Now you hang from that. Oh, man, that's, that's a scripture. Boy, I wish I don't have time to do that. No, no, no. I've taken enough. I've taken enough. <laughs> but we, <clears throat> if you stay attached, you'll see yourself forming into a new creation. And when this process is finished, the Bible says you will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and you'll be like him. God wants to give you back your inheritance, which is his mind, his spirit, that you may be in his image and likeness and handle the business of ruling the earth and the universe and what he created. That's your destiny. And it starts from obedience to this command. Read. Read with the help of your Lord who creates man from a clot. Read and your Lord is most generous who taught man by the pen what man knew not. That command that was given to Prophet Muhammad by the angel Jibreel. And in my talk with my Islamic brothers, I said, do you remember a hadith of the Prophet where he said a man all dressed in white came in the midst of him and his companions and asked him questions about the faith? And the prophet answered the questions, and the man walked away. And the prophet asked his companions, do you know who that was? He said, no. He said, that was the angel, Jibreel, in human form. In human form. So when Master Farad Muhammad came to Elijah Muhammad. He offered him this book, but he offered it to him in Arabic and told him, read. And Muhammad answered, but I can't read. He said, read with the help of Allah who created man and taught man by the pen what man do not read. Your Lord is most generous. And then he named him Karim. See, and the root is Akram. Uh, from the word Akram, Karim, you get noble, generous, honorable. He knew the man he was teaching was noble, was honorable, was generous. And he named him Kareem. And in the end, when he was about to go, 
he asked his ministers, well, you have chosen some to teach you. Would you allow me to choose one for you? They said, yes. And Elijah Kareem was in the back of the room and he called him forward and he said, hear him. He gave him the name Muhammad, the Ummi messenger, the Messiah to the children of Israel that we may be children not of Israel but the sons and daughters of God himself. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Oh, to Allah. For the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, you can keep your applause going. We have received a beautiful, beautiful message this afternoon, this morning, from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Did you have a question? No. Did you hold it on your mind? Was it answered? How many of you had your questions answered by what you heard today? Oh, isn't that wonderful? See, that shows that God used your brother as a channel. He's not worthy of worship, but respect, yes. You can honor him, yes, but all praise, really. All honor and worship belongs to the one God, Allah. He has no equal, no rival. And that's who we want you to fasten your love on, is Allah. And when you do that and attach yourself to his Messiah, grow. Thank you for answering that question. You, you were truthful, weren't you? Yes, sir. May Allah bless you all. And you know what would make me real happy? What are you going to teach next week, uh, Ishmael? Oh, you've given me a lot. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, look, I'm telling you, if you really respect and love what you heard today, this young man, son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I want you to, no, nah, I don't want you to promise me. I just want you to make up in your mind that you want to hear more. And you come back and hear this young man. Oh, and we got some fireballs around here that, oh boy. And guess what? You're one of them too. All you got to do is get your attachment, keep on growing, and before you know it, you'll be so beautiful that the whole world will accept you in the best of civilized society. Thank you for honoring me Thank this you, day brother. with your presence. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir. All praise is due to Allah. All praise. Brothers and sisters, we are going to close with prayer, but can you take your seat? We just have one item of business to take care of, and that is to know how many of you are visiting us today for your very first time. Can we see your hands? Welcome, welcome, welcome. How many of you believe that what you heard this morning is the truth and is good for our people, good for the human being good for the human family. Can I see your hands? Praise be to Allah. How many of you were inspired by today's message? 
that you would like to learn more of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and would like to unite and become a part of the Nation of Islam and help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan take those universal principles and that truth that he spoke to us today and spread it throughout our community that we can begin the process of making the needed change for ourselves. How many of you would like to do that? Let me see your hands. Raise them high. Don't feel bashful. My sisters, well, my beautiful sisters that raised their hand, my dear brothers, those of you who raised their hand, I would like the honor and the privilege on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to shake your hand and to welcome you personally to the Nation of Islam this morning. The brothers that raised their hand, all of my sisters that raised their hand, if you would stand up where you are, make your way down the center aisle without feeling bashful, I will extend my hand to your hand on behalf of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Brothers and sisters, please give Brother Minister Ishmael Muhammad the honor and the privilege of shaking your hand. We simply want to welcome you home to your nation of Islam. Those who are watching live via the internet all over the nation of Islam, please do likewise. Come on down the center aisle, brothers and sisters. The truth has been shared, and we simply want to welcome you home to the nation of Islam. While our brothers and sisters are coming down the center aisle, we want you to know that today's message from prayer to prayer will be available for you on DVD and CD. For those who are watching via the internet, store.finalcall.com. For those who are live at Mosque Mariam, come on right next door and visit us at Muhammad University of Islam to get your high-speed duplicated DVD and CD. We also want you to know for those who listen to the minister via MP3 player, in about three hours you will be able to go on store.finalcall.com and get your MP3 of today's message. We also want you to know that the book that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan held up today is available. This magnificent book is available for you as well right next door. Visit us at store.finalcall.com. We thank you so very much. Don't these wonderful brothers and sisters look beautiful coming down the center aisle? They've been fed today as we all have, and all praise is due to Allah. Let us give it up for all of our wonderful brothers and sisters and our beautiful elder coming down the center aisle. We thank Allah for each and every one of you live from Mosque Mariam, those watching via the internet and every mosque and study group. We thank you so much for your attention. We thank you for your time and we thank you for the wonderful spirit that you generated to help the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan deliver an earth-shaking announcement. Give yourselves another wonderful round of applause. want to uh, remind all of our registered believers and processing believers that Minister Farrakhan will be back out this Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. and we are looking forward to what uh, he will share with us as we uh, move forward in our nation. So with that said, please stand as we close this wonderful service today with prayer, thanking Allah for his blessing and thanking him for his servant, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve, and to thee alone do we beseech for help. 
O oh Allah, guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favors, not the path of those upon whom your wrath is brought down, nor of those who go astray after they have heard thy teachings. Say he, Allah is one. Allah is he on whom we all depend. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Amin. May the peace and blessings of Allah go with you. Remember to do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. To all of our visiting